Hello fellow sim racers and welcome to part one of this sim racing setup guide. I've been inundated with requests to do a video all about car setups, but since it's such a massive topic it's taken me a bit of time to work out how I'd like to tackle the subject. As a consequence of the scale and heaviness of the subject matter, this guide is split up into several smaller videos, which I'll be uploading over the course of the next few days. In this video I'm going to be outlining the basics and give you guys an overview of what to expect through the rest of the series, so stick around and we'll get started. First up, a word about how I've constructed these videos and who they're meant for. I've made this series with beginners in mind, so I try to assume nothing of the viewer. That is to say, I try to explain everything as much as possible. So with that in mind, some more experienced sim racers may find some of the sections are a bit basic. So please accept my apologies if you're in that category and make liberal use of the progress bar if needed. Furthermore, these videos are meant for those that race on circuits and road courses, as I don't really know enough about ovals, dirt and drifting to give any sort of vaguely coherent opinion on the subject. As I mentioned earlier, I've split the subject into several smaller videos, in part to make the project more manageable, and also to make the individual parts more searchable. The first 10 videos explain the ins and outs of each setup area, trying to explain the how and the why. Then videos 11 and 12 start to bring everything together and talk through the process of building a setup. Finally, I've included video 13 as a case study of a setup that I created for the Audi R8 GT3 car in Assetto Corsa. If you're watching this video at the time it goes live, I plan to have all 13 parts uploaded within the next week. For those who like to skip around, I'll put links to each part in the video descriptions. Finally, most of the footage for these videos is shot in Assetto Corsa, simply because it's the most user-friendly sim to capture footage from. But the information contained in the series applies to all of the major sims. And where there are minor differences between how various sims operate, I've tried to point it out. Let's be honest, default setups in racing sims really do vary in quality. And a good setup can change a car that feels terrible out of the box to something much more drivable. But more than that, a good setup can be worth a significant amount of lap time. Not only because the car itself is faster, but because you feel more confident pushing it to the limit. But setups are heavily influenced by the circumstances in which the car is going to be driven. For example, a setup that works well for a single hot lap will likely be unsuitable for an endurance race. Similarly, wet setups differ significantly from those used in the dry, and the track surface and circuit layout also have a massive impact on setup decisions. So while it's common for people to make a baseline setup to work from, it's important to remember that there's really no such thing as an all round setup. I'm going to say right off the bat that if you're still learning to sim race and you're struggling with car control, then playing with setups isn't likely to help you. Moreover, until you really get a feel for how a car's behaving in a racing sim, you're unlikely to be able to make any sort of sensible changes to the setup anyway. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't learn about the various aspects of setup work, as they will form an important part of your skill set as you develop as a sim racer. First things first, it's important to note that every adjustment you make has an impact on the wider system as a whole. For example, if you soften the front springs, you'll affect the balance and change the ride height, which in turn may make the car bottom out over bumps and also impact the efficiency of the aerodynamics. Furthermore, there's usually more than one way to cure a handling deficiency in a car. If you're suffering from turn-in understeer, for example, you could consider altering the tyre pressures, front anti-roll bar, the springs, the differential or the wing settings. So race cars are a complex system and you really need to understand how each of the parts interact to work on a setup. And moreover, you need to treat the system holistically if you want to get anywhere at all. The next point is something that I can't stress enough. As a sim racer, you're forced to play the role of both driver and engineer, and you need the feel of the former and the analytical detachment of the latter to develop a car setup. So it follows that setup changes need to be undertaken with a scientific approach. When you feel something's wrong with a car, you need to consider a solution, make the setup change, test it, and then analyze whether it was effective. And the golden rule is only change one variable at a time. There's no right or wrong way to test setup changes, but the key details to make sure you minimize the number of variables. So run test sessions at the same time of day, on the same track conditions, and with the same stint lengths. If you're an experienced sim racer, this next section will be very old news. But for the rest, it's important that we define a few key concepts and terms before we get into the detailed stuff in later videos. First up, and this is really basic, but it's important that we know how to define understeer and oversteer and talk about the different types. 
Understeer occurs when a car's front tyres lose grip during cornering, causing them to slide across the road surface. This invariably means that you can't get the car turned in and you're left in no man's land miles away from the apex. Understeer that occurs as you begin to turn into a corner is called turn in understeer, while power understeer happens when you're back on the throttle and accelerating away from the corner. Oversteer on the other hand occurs when the rear tyres lose traction during cornering, causing the back end of the car to step out in a slide. If you catch the slide, it looks badass, but it's not exactly quick. Oversteer that happens as you turn the car in is, intuitively, called turn in oversteer, while oversteer that takes place when you're back on the power is called power oversteer. Mid-corner oversteer is the name given to any tail-happy moments that occur between the turn in point and where you get back on the power. Next up is balance. When drivers talk about car balance, they're really talking about the distribution of grip between the front and the rear of the car. If the front has more grip than the rear, then the car is described as rear limited, and the car will want to oversteer when it's driven on the limit. And the opposite is true. If you have less grip at the front than the rear, the car is front limited and you're going to be living with a healthy dose of understeer. Achieving a balance that's both comfortable to drive and fast is pretty much the holy grail of setup work. A car that's a bit too front limited may be docile to drive, but you may struggle to carry enough speed into corners to maintain a good pace. Conversely, a car with a loose rear will be difficult to drive, and every time you get into a slide, you'll lose time, so it's all about finding the balance. Another important concept to understand is how the stiffness or compliance of a car's chassis impacts grip. Generally speaking, the softer a car is sprung, the more grip it has. And that's because a car that has soft suspension is better at distributing the load equally between all four tyres when you're cornering or going over bumps. However, the stiffness of your springs also has to take into account your desired ride height, the bumpiness of the track surface, and whether your car generates any aerodynamic downforce. So it's all about finding the right compromise. Don't worry, we'll be talking about the pros and cons of suspension stiffness in video five of this series. So that just about covers all of the very basic stuff. And that means in the next video, we can start looking at things in much closer detail. In part two, we're going to be talking about tyres and how their compound, pressure and temperature are probably the most important variables on a race car. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then it would be great if you could hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. And if you think the video will be helpful for others, then please consider sharing it. As always, thank you for donating your precious free time by watching. It is very much appreciated. So all that's left to say is goodbye, thank you for watching and enjoy the rest of your day.